Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Who's ready for the word? And you know what that means? Your heart is here. Your mind is here. You're not thinking about where you're going after church and what you're going to do. But you're saying, Lord, speak to me. I need a word. That's what ready for the word means. Amen. Our expositor today is the son of this ministry, someone we love dearly, and someone who always, always leaves us with a word from the Lord. Let's welcome our pastor, Stephen Samuel, of the Westbury Gospel Tabernacle. Hallelujah. Let's give Jesus all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Hallelujah. He's bringing us through. Tell your neighbor, he's bringing us through. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We rejoice in the goodness of the Lord. You may be seated. What a privilege it is to be here at Bethel this morning. And we give God all the praise. How wonderful it is to come to this oasis. Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? This world is filled with bad news. You turn on the television, bad news. At work, in the neighborhood, bad news. But you can come into a place like this, the house of God. And you can lift up your hands. And you can remind yourself and be reminded by others, there is a God. Who wants to live in a world without the hope and the truth and the fact that there is a God above it all? So just tell your neighbor, whatever you're going through, remember Jehovah is above it all. Amen. It's a joy and a privilege to be here. And certainly we've done it already, but would you please help me first to honor in their absence, the senior pastor of this church, Pastor Roderick Caesar III, his dear wife, Stephanie, their darling daughter, Sila. She just gets cuter and cuter. We certainly honor them, and it's a privilege to come here. And as we have uh, said and understand in this church, it's important to let your leaders have rest. You know, you're doing yourself a favor when your leaders go on vacation because they can go and be refreshed. You know, carrying the weight of a congregation is heavy. It's not just coming up here to preach when your pastor preaches the word, but he's carrying you throughout the week and to be able to refresh with his wife and daughter is so important. And they will come back to this place, to us with a rejuvenated heart. Aren't you looking forward to that? And please help me to honor my pastor, Bishop Roderick Caesar, his wife, Pastor Beverly. We honor them in their absence today. Certainly good to be here at Bethel all the time with my good friend, Pastor Beverly Sherrod, and her husband, Reverend John. These are good friends, and we thank God for them and to Reverend Carl and his wife and all the clergy here. Thank God for all the leaders of Bethel this morning. So glad to have my wife and daughters here today. <laughs> Yesterday, our daughters went out with some of the young people, and they went go-karting. My youngest doesn't even have her permit yet, but they went go-karting. Go-karting is not like bumper cars. Go-karting is you go, I don't know how many miles per hour. But uh, they had a full day, and then, and I was, you know, I was, uh, I knew they were dead tired yesterday. But this morning, they did not have to be compelled. They love coming to Bethel. So I thank God for them and for my wife. I'm going to ask if you would take your Bibles, please, and turn to the Psalms. Psalm 146. Your pastor let me know how wonderfully, how wonderful it is that you have been in the theme of faith. And so today we want to talk about the danger of putting our trust in the wrong places, particularly the wrong kind of people. So I'm going to ask you to stand uh, today, if you would, 
and we're going to go to Psalm 146. I'm just going to read verses 3 through 7. I'm going to use the NIV, but whatever have a translation you have should be absolutely fine. Psalm 146, reading verses 3 through 7. It says, Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. I want you to tell your neighbor, skip the princes and trust the king. You may be seated. This morning as we go to the Word of God, I just want to share with you some thoughts from the Scripture. And the first is this. In our weakness, we gravitate toward princes. In our weakness, I would add in our sinful weakness, we tend toward, we gravitate toward Princes, and we're an equal opportunity church, princesses as well. Now, what is meant by princes here in this translation? Well, the Hebrew word translated prince is the word nadiv. And according to one source, it can mean the inclined, the generous, the noble. And, and one definition, according to this source of, of Nadiv, is a noble. The commentator Derek Kidner explains that a modern equivalent of princes would be the influential. So maybe you want to put that in verse 3 as you read it. Do not put your trust in the influential see a prince in this meaning is not simply someone if we apply it today who who wears a crown or a robe a prince could be your boss it could be the people that you look up to and there's nothing wrong with looking up to the right people. But the contrast in this psalm is what should warn us. When you put your trust in the princes instead of in the Lord. Because of sinful human nature, we are tempted to believe the cynical slogan. I think most of us have heard that it's not what you know, it's... Who you know. And uh, we, we learned that early on. And because we believe that, we crave, if we're weak, to know the right people. We learn early on that if I'm going to get ahead, I've got to know and latch on to the right people. Just ask children. Are there, I know there are educators or those in the educational system here. Just raise your hand. Your teacher, principals, you know, thank you. Uh, you know, observing, especially younger grades, you can watch children. And if you ask them, who are the popular kids in your class? They'll be able to point them out. At a very young age. They'll be able to tell you uh, who's popular. They'll tell you who gets picked first for teams. 
Who tells the jokes that others laugh at? And sadly, who becomes the object of jokes? They will tell you who is the friend that you need to have so you can have other friends. They will tell you who you need to know so that you get invited to the parties and the, the events. And so we learn even as children that we better know the right princes. We better know the right people if we want acceptance. This is the purely humanistic way of thinking. And, and sometimes in our desire to fit in with the princes, sometimes if we're so desperate and if we only have this one-track mind that uh, I, I need to know certain people, I, I need to have the right connections, sometimes if that desire is greater in us than a trust in God, we will even violate our convictions. That's what peer pressure is about. Peer pressure is about craving acceptance by the princes and the princesses so badly that we will even hurt ourselves to get into the royal club. But the Word of God says, don't put your trust in the princes. And sometimes we, we bring this infatuation with the influential into the workplace. We bring it into the career. We bring it into our jobs. And, and because of this, if we have that one-track mind that I've got to know the right people, I've got to impress the right people, if we're not careful, we can, we can fall into that situation. And that's why I believe in a lot of workplaces, you've got the maturity of a middle school. You don't have to say amen. Because... If people are only looking to impress the prince, they follow the same sort of mindset they did in school. They play the same juvenile games. We gossip about people. We slander people. How can you look good and, and me let that happen? I've got to pull you down so that I can look good. And all kinds of games are played at the workplace. What's that about? They, they're just trusting in the princes. They just want to be part of that club. It is so dangerous when the Lord is not our trust. Because if the Lord is not our trust, then we will act foolishly to impress some influential person, thinking that that is the way to the top. But the Word of God says... Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. I don't need to remind you that sometimes people who have princely status are really quite evil. Influential, just tell someone that influential people can be evil. And if I could prove it to you, if you would hold your place in Psalm one. 46, but turn to Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32, verse 5. There's a prediction made in Isaiah 32, verse 5, of a time where it says, No longer will the fool be called noble, nor the scoundrel be highly respected. In other words, in Isaiah's day, there were fools that were considered noble. There were scoundrels that were respected. And friends, the same thing is happening in our world today. Just because you have influence doesn't mean that you are a prince worth following. Now, even in church, and I'm not going to be before you long. <laughs> but even in church, we can get caught up in this prince syndrome. Well, 
can I just mention a few kinds of princes? In church, we can get caught up in political princes. And, and by the way, I'm a, a bipartisan preacher. I'm not here to pick on one party or the other. I think whatever your uh, voter registration says, you can be guilty of this. Of any administration where you and I can latch on to a particular candidate, a particular party, a particular slogan, and we can latch on to that and get so caught up and invest our hopes in a political prince. I'm not saying that we should not be engaged. I'm not saying that we should not be discerning. We should. But we can cross a line where we are more consumed with the buttons and the t-shirts and the hats and we don't anymore speak about what the Bible says. You don't have to say amen, but I'm going to preach it anyway. Sometimes in church, we are caught up with our political prince. It could be a current prince. It could be a past prince. But I heard the Lord say, do not put your trust in princes. Because if you love your prince or your princess too much, you're so caught up in the personality. You're so depending on who's in the house, who's got the title, that you don't pray like you ought to pray, and you don't seek God like you ought to seek Him, seek Him, and you don't depend on Him like you ought to depend on Him. You've been talking about faith, but we need to confess our sin of putting too much faith in political princes. Let me mention another prince the church can get caught up in. We can get caught up in celebrity princes. Don't misunderstand me. I get excited when I hear that this famous television or movie or musical personality loves the Lord Jesus. We should be excited. And we should also recognize there are people in the entertainment industry that genuinely love the Lord. And they need our prayers. And it's not right to tear down people and broadly say that because they're on TV. Or, no, thank God they're there. So don't misquote or misunderstand me. But at the same time, if we have latched onto a celebrity prince or princess, we can fall into the mindset that we need their validation in order to feel good as a church. But friends, when I read the scripture, there were people who loved the Lord when there was no celebrity validation. Our family took a trip, an adventure. I was telling uh, Pastor Sherrod, we took a trip to Rome, and it was an adventure. It was, it was a, just a tremendous trip, and, and we saw the Colosseum. And there we are in the Colosseum, and, and the, 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 you, you walk in that place and you recognize, my goodness, the bloodshed that has happened here. And you're reminded of persecution, even of God's people. But there in the Colosseum, and I don't know when they put it up, but if you go, you will see a cross put up there right in the Colosseum, a large cross in the Colosseum. And how wonderful it is as a reminder that even though at one time people made sport and they, they, they denigrated human dignity and even went against the church of Jesus Christ, but in the end, the Colosseum with its crumbling bricks cannot stand up against the cross of Jesus Christ. Friends, we've got to understand, if you put your trust in princes, you're putting your trust in a crumbling system. But I want to put my trust in the one who went all the way to Calvary just for me. Administrations come and go. Celebrities come and go. The billboard number one is coming and going. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, 
and forever. Praise the name of the Lord. I wonder if the church is going to repent and say, Lord, I've been spending too much time on the political princes and on the celebrity princes, but it's time for me to worship at your feet. If you believe it's true, just give God the glory right now. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Friends, we don't need a celebrity endorsement to be proud of ourselves as a church. And we've got nothing to be proud of ourselves in. But we find our dignity and our worth in the one who came from heaven to earth to be the way, the truth, and the life so that we could be redeemed. You don't need someone on TV to say they believe in the church. We need to say we believe in Jesus. And that's all we need to believe in. If you agree with me, say hallelujah to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Tell your neighbor, don't look at the princes. Don't look at the princes. Because there are princes in the entertainment and princesses in the entertainment industry. One day they are quoting scripture. And the next day they are propagating things that should make any Christian squirm. But if you love your prince or princess too much, you can fall into the danger of giving them diplomatic immunity in your mind. You say, well, that's a prince. That's a princess. So you know how it is. Yeah, I know how it is. The word of God tells me how it is. We've got to confirm not with Hollywood or not with Bollywood or not with uh, uh, some studio. We need to confirm, conform with the word of God. But if your heart is set on the prince or the princess, then your moral clarity can get foggy. But perhaps one of the most ironic idolatries we commit in the church is when we set up our own church princes. Because unfortunately... We in the church have a propensity to put preachers, musicians, singers, church leaders, and we put them on pedestals. We do. And we put them on pedestals, and now this one has become, we might not say it, But we say, that's my prince or princess. And we create these larger than life images of people. We should appreciate those who serve the Lord. Appreciate the gift God has given them. But keep in mind, God gave it to them. We have nothing that we did not receive from the Lord. And I'm not going to stand up here and hold this microphone and act like I don't feel the pull toward pride. This platform's a dangerous place. The platform at Westbury is a dangerous place. Because, I mean, in real life, I'm not this tall. I'm close. No, I'm not. Not even close. But you know, anybody can get on a platform like this. Look at all you handsome and beautiful people. And the microphone's on. The lights are on. And pretty soon you can begin to think you're somebody. Pretty soon you can think you're a prince. Or a princess. Hello? Dangerous. Dangerous. You remember the old story? I'm probably going to mess it up because it wasn't in my notes. I'll try anyway. If I get it wrong, it'll just humble me. But you remember the old story about the, I think it was a preacher who got up, you know, these, these stories, who knows if it's true or not, but the story goes a preacher got up and he started to preach. He thought he was, when he was coming up, he thought, man, this is going to be great. They're all going to be, he just felt like they're really going to be eating out of his hand. But he got up there, and boy, he blew it. And as he's sheepishly going back down, somebody said, if you had gone up the way you came down, 
you would have come down the way you went up. See, the problem is we have made mental coronation ceremonies. Forget Harry and Meghan. We think we are royalty. And in church, we have a tendency to make people royalty. Oh, that is a prince. That is a princess. But I heard the Lord say, do not put your trust in princes, but put your trust in the Lord. Now, very quickly, we want to look at why princes are poor objects of trust. And if you look at verses 3 and 4, uh, there are some points there very quickly that just prove why you should never put your trust in an earthly prince or princess. Uh, first of all, because it says in verse 3, do not put your trust in princes and mortal men who cannot save. Number one, don't trust an earthly prince. They cannot save. It doesn't matter how well you think you preach or sing or play or whatever you think you can do. Nobody comes to Jesus because of you. They come to Jesus because the Holy Ghost has drawn them, convicted them of sin, awakened their heart, uh, awakened, regenerated. And so you are the instrument. I'm the instrument. But princes don't save. Tell your neighbor, princes don't save. Let's personalize it. Say, preachers don't save. Singers don't save. Church leaders don't save. Only Jesus saves. Amen. I think this is one of the secrets to uh, Billy Graham's longevity and ministry. Because he was a humble man. He was genuinely afraid of trying, of pride and of trying to do things without the grace and the mercy of God. And if you're here today, I know many of you are in ministry. I speak to myself, I speak to all of us. We've got to recognize every day we depend on the grace and the power of Jesus Christ. Princes don't say. The other thing, and, and it's, it's a reminder, princes eventually die. They do. Look at verse uh, 3. It says they're mortal men. Verse 4 says, when their spirit departs. It doesn't say if their spirit departs. It says when their spirit departs, they return to the ground. So princes don't save, and princes don't live forever in terms of this earthly Present existence. And then also, princes are poor objects of trust because their plans eventually come to nothing. Now let me qualify that. And, and, and we know the song, only what you do for Christ will last. So if you are uh, an instrument being used by God for His plan, then you are living and working and serving with eternal purpose. But we're talking about earthly princes. We're talking about earthly princesses. We're talking about people who are influential in the natural. Well, they can have all the plans they want, but when they die, so, so do their plans. So princes of this world are a poor object of trust. So I've tried to share with you why our inf infatuation with, with influential people is dangerous. The Lord said, don't put your trust in princes. And I don't know what prince or princess, maybe none of you have that problem, but maybe there's some in here who say, you know what, I love the Lord, but I have found my heart being pulled. I found a struggle in me where on the one hand, I, I say I trust the Lord, but on the other hand, I, I've fallen into the cynical mindset that I'm only going to get ahead. If I'm in a certain network, or if I know certain people, or if that prince is favorable toward me. Maybe there are some young people today who, who you felt the pull and you said, you know what, there have been times that I tried to get into the prince's uh, uh, sphere. And so maybe you've even compromised your principles. And you've done things and said things and acted in ways that you know are not biblical just so that you could get on the prince or princess's favor. 
The good news is there's forgiveness today. And so in the, in the moments that I have left, I just want to share with you some reasons why only the king of heaven is worthy of our trust. Would you just tell your neighbor that only the king of heaven is worthy of your trust? Because it says in Psalm 146 verse 5, in contrast to the misplaced trust in the princes, it says in verse 5, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. I want to quickly give you four reasons why you should rejoice and have your hope in the Lord your God. There are many, countless others, but here are four from the text. First of all, number one, because the Lord made everything. Even those people that we look up to, even those princes and princesses that we put on pedestals, remember the Lord made them. Look please again at uh, Psalm 146 verses 5 and 6. It says, blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the, what? Maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. How can any of us really brag if we remember that the Lord made us? That's why the scripture says we should come and bow before the Lord our maker. Because if you don't bow regularly before the Lord, your maker, pretty soon you think you're a self-made man, self-made woman. Look at my degrees. Look at the club I'm in. Look at my credentials. No, we need to bow before the Lord, our maker. Thank God you're in a church where worship of God is a priority. When you come every Sunday, led by this outstanding worship team and music department, they are leading you, leading us, so that we may bow before the Lord, our maker. Don't put your trust in princes. They didn't make you. Bow before the Lord because He made everything. And by the way, if you latch on to a prince or a princess, an influential person. And if, if they are the one that determines your happiness, you know, it's possible to be so caught up in the opinion of somebody and, and you're happy when, when they give you the recommendation. You're happy when they give you the accolades, but then they give you a critical word. Or, or they don't seem impressed with you anymore. Or they don't give you the attention they used to give you. And then what can happen? If your hope was in the prince or the princess, then what happens? Then you get deflated. Because your self-esteem was based on the prince. Hello? But if you would just get away from that and say, No, my esteem is based on the Lord my maker. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You say, but pastor, I've got, I've got issues, I've got challenges, I've got, I've got, no, no, no. If the Lord made you and if you belong to him, you can smile and say, thank God, I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. But pastor, there are things I would like to change. No, the Lord loves, I'm not talking about moral changes, I'm talking, you might say my physical or my, my something that is, is external. No, the Lord loves you, you are precious to him, don't. Try to get your esteem from the princes. But look up and say, thank God the Lord is my maker. If you're glad the Lord is your maker, just give him praise right now. He loves you. 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 Don't look at the cover of Cosmopolitan or, or some other mag or GQ or something to, to get your sense of what is perfect. No, I want to tell you, God loves you and he has a plan for your life and you don't have to trust in the word of a prince or a princess, but you need to say, the Lord is my maker. He, he made me. He, he formed me in the womb. Hallelujah. I am somebody because the Lord 
took the time to make me. And if I belong to him, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10 that there are works that are prepared in advance for me to do. Don't trust in a prince. And don't get hurt by a prince or a princess because the Lord is your maker. He made everything. And secondly, we should trust in the Lord because the Lord is faithful forever. Did you see that in, in, in the last part of verse 6? The Lord who remains faithful forever. The new King James says he keeps truth forever. Have you ever met people who, who they, they, they flip on you? They switch. And one day they say, oh yes, we'll do it this way. Oh yes, you've got my word. And the next moment, they have broken faith. But the Lord will never break faith with his people. I think we sang it this morning in one of the songs. The Lord does not lie. He's not a man that he should lie. I need to bow before the Lord because he's my maker. And because he remains faithful forever. There are princes who will not be faithful But God is faithful. And a third reason why you should put your absolute trust in the Lord of heaven and not in a man or woman is because the Lord genuinely cares for suffering people. Sometimes some princes only want you for votes. Or they only want you for money. Or they only want you for their entourage or what have you. But the Lord genuinely cares for us when we're in our worst condition. You have to dress up for some earthly princes, but but God came down for us in our worst condition. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8 that while we were sinners, hallelujah, Christ died for us. Praise the name of the Lord. Aren't you glad the Lord loved you in your worst condition? I'm glad he loves me on my worst day. Hallelujah. He loves me not just when I'm holding a mic, but but when I don't feel so good about myself. I wonder if there's anybody out there that knows what I'm talking about. You know, sometimes you can be your own worst critic. But thank God he still loves me. He loves me on my best. Just say it with me. He loves me on my best day. He loves me on my worst day. His love never changes. If you believe it, come on and give the Lord praise just for a minute. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. His love is not based on how you feel about yourself. But his love is self-generated in terms of himself in his own holy, wonderful, perfect nature. The Lord cares for suffering people. Now look at verses 7 through 9. And we see several categories of suffering people. And I see myself in in the list. I I hope you do too. Look at verses 7 through 9. I'm reading from the NIV again. It says, He upholds the cause of the oppressed. There are princes who may neglect the oppressed. But the king of heaven cares about the oppressed. And then it says he gives food to the hungry. Sometimes the prince or the princess may not care about the hungry, but he gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. And there are literal prisoners behind bars, and there are prisoners behind mental and emotional bars. Walking around our sidewalk, sitting in church. But something that happened to you, you feel shackled. But I believe that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And God can set somebody free this morning because he's able to do it. The King of heaven is here. Verse 8. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. Have you ever felt bowed down? He cares about those who are bowed down. Verse 9, the Lord watches over the alien. 
princes can ignore the alien, the outsider. He sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. Princes and princesses may ignore you. But the king of heaven cares about you, whatever condition you're in. In a matter of moments, we're going to go to prayer. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I am going through something right now. And I confess that I have put too much trust. Because sometimes we are part of our own problem. Because we have put so much stock in the prince. The word of the prince. The word of the princess. And because they disappointed us, we live in a state of, of sorrow. But today I pray the Lord will open our eyes to look up higher. To stop looking at the earthly princes. And to realize that we have sinned by putting our trust in people when we should have looked to the Lord to begin with. As verse 5 says, blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. And then lastly, we should trust in the Lord of heaven and not on earthly princes, because while we said that earthly princes, they don't, they don't stay in this uh, capacity forever, but it says in verse 10 that the Lord reigns forever. Forever. He doesn't need an election. He, he, he's, he's not nervous about uh, getting votes or, 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 or any, he's, he's on the throne forever. Forever. Why do you put your trust in people who don't last forever in terms of their earthly status? We've got to recognize that only the king of heaven reigns forever. So as we get ready to go to prayer, remember, don't put your trust in any earthly influential person. Remember that only God is your maker. Only God keeps his promises. Only God will love you in your worst condition and only the Lord reigns forever. Let's stand together right now. As we stand together this morning, I just want to ask three questions. And I ask you to pray for everyone in this room, including myself, that God's holy will would be done. How helpless we are to change a life. I can't change anybody. But we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to change a life. I want to ask three questions. The first question is this. Is there anybody here who says, today I repent. I've been putting too much trust in the earthly princes. I have invested too much of my hopes and dreams in an earthly prince or princess but today I'm repenting and I'm turning to God that's the first group the second group I'm going to ask and maybe overlapping I'm going to ask the question is there someone here today who says I've been negligent in praising God my maker the one who has always kept his promises the one who loves me in my worst condition, the one who reigns forever. There are some of us who need to repent of both. I put too much trust in the earthly voices and I have neglected to get to know through the word, through prayer, the one who should be the only object of my trust. And then the third and the all-encompassing question I ask today, the most important, is if there's anybody here who says, Pastor, I have... I've never actually humbled myself and repented of my sins and trusted Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Savior. Well, that is your most important need this morning. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'd like to ask 
this question, these questions in reverse. First of all, if you're here today and you say, if I die today, I don't know where I'm spending eternity. But you say, Pastor, I'd like to humbly receive the forgiveness that Christ purchased on the cross of Calvary for me. I believe he rose from the dead to give me eternal life. And today, I want to receive him as my Savior. If that's you, would you raise your hand and you say, yes, I need Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior. Do I see anyone's hand? Okay, I'm going to ask everyone who knows that if you die today and you are ready, somebody asking for prayer, thank you for your honesty. Anybody else? Come on. Anybody else? Anybody else who says, me too, I need Christ, raise your hand. I'm going to ask the one who raised your hand, please raise it again. I'd like to just have prayer with you right at this altar. If there's anyone here, we want to make sure we've served everyone. Okay, I'm going to ask everyone who can say, if I die today, I know that I am saved. You can take your seat. If you're not sure, stay standing. Let somebody pray for you. Let somebody pray for you. Is there anyone standing? I pray that everyone here knows Jesus as Savior. And if you have any questions, please don't leave this building without speaking to one of the spiritual leaders. The second question I would ask if you're here today and you say in either of those two categories earlier, you say either I need to stop putting my trust in earthly princes and I've got to repent of that and get to know my God in a better way. If that's you, I'm not going to ask you to come up, but if you say, I just want to be included in prayer, stand right where you are. We're going to pray for you right now. If anyone's here, God bless you for your honesty, for your honesty. You're saying, I'm turning away from earthly voices. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop depending on that, and I'm going to get to know God. See, when you get to know God, you'll realize if He loves me, it really doesn't matter what other people think. Amen? Amen. Can we pray for everyone in the room right now? Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Father, you know how we are. We're weak, Lord. In our weakness, Lord, we gravitate toward earthly affirmation. We gravitate toward voices and people and popular sorts of things. But Lord, remind us today that if the maker of heaven and earth, if the redeemer of sinners, the one who reigns forever loves us, then this is the greatest love of all, the love that surpasses all other love. Lord, give us hearts that will worship you, will get to know you, and will depend on your love alone. Bless these, your people. Strengthen them, Lord. Give them a new joy as they discover your word. Open the scripture to them in a new way. Bless their time of prayer in a new way. And make them, oh God, vessels of honor in these days. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Let's give the Lord praise this, this morning. Hallelujah.